Jim Sigler here for Brainwaves. We're going to start this week's program with a story. Here we go. Colleen Castaldo was and is a kindergarten teacher. This is Dr. Jeff Aguirre sharing the case of a patient he saw. Until she presented with a seizure, which was ultimately shown to be the result of a right occipitotemporal glioma. And Dr. Aguirre can use her name because this is actually a story that's been on the news before. You can see it from 60 Minutes. And she underwent surgery to have that resected. And in the period after her surgery, she realized she just couldn't recognize faces. And for her, this was a particularly devastating and crushing disability because she had prided herself on her ability to not only know all the kids in her class, but to actually learn the identities and names of her kids within the first two days of school. And she couldn't do it anymore. She couldn't tell the kids apart. And for her, this was a real crushing development. So Colleen sought a number of different medical opinions to see if there was something that could be done to help out with this. She saw me at one point. And we did some uh, neuroimaging testing that revealed that she had this area, of course, which had been removed in the right hemisphere. But there was still, in the left hemisphere, a patch of cortex which was responsive to faces. And Colleen, like most prosopagnosics, was unable to perceive sort of full integrated faces, but she could certainly recognize individual face parts. Which Colleen learned to use as clues to figuring out whose face she was looking at. Bobby's the one with the curly hair and the freckles. Lydia always wears a bow. Eloise is missing her two front teeth. But that's not enough. So Dr. Aguirre and another neurologist, an expert in face blindness from Harvard, Brad Duchesne, worked with Colleen with the hope of restoring her ability to recognize faces. And the sad truth is it didn't make her better. She did, however, get better at recognizing people using things besides their face. And she adapted quite well to this trouble and continued to teach kindergarten. And now relying on the sound of kids' voices and other sorts of features apart from the center of their face to identify different people. While Colleen's story is sad, it demonstrates the fascinating complexity of visual information processing, the inability to recognize a person by their face, but still retaining the ability to piece together discrete facial components, hair color, nose size, ear configuration and then using semantic memory to correlate these features with a singular person. Back in college, one of my favorite classes was systems neuroscience. It was a class taught by a neuroscientist who studied visual information processing, a lot like this, in macaque brains, Stuart Hendry. Probably one of the hardest classes I ever took, but when I look back on it, I think this was one of the classes that inspired me to pursue a career in medicine and neurology. In this class, one of the major themes that continued to surface throughout the course was the balance of bottom-up processing and top-down processing of sensory information. Bottom-up processing referred to the integration of simple units of sensory data, like sounds of a certain frequency, into more complex patterns, like that of a voice or a melody, and into even more complex configurations that you would recognize as a person's speech or a particular song. Top-down processing is the opposite, like when you look up at a cloud in the sky, and instead of recognizing the edges or shades of the cloud, you see the cloud take the shape of a rabbit or a pirate ship. There's not a single basic component of the cloud that particularly resembles an animal or a boat, but your mind imagines it so. And all of a sudden, there's a pirate ship in the sky. Top-down processing. In this week's program, we're going to talk all about that and what kinds of clinical and physiological implications come with it, from the simplest photoreceptors in the retina to grandmother neurons. Stay with us. But okay, so what would you like to try and cover and talk about today? Okay. Let's see. So this is Dr. Jeffrey Aguirre. I'm Jeff Aguirre, an associate professor of neurology at the University of Pennsylvania. He previously joined me on the show to discuss agnosia and the fascinating visual world of Alice's adventures in Wonderland. My research focus is on translational vision science. So I study how visual representations are built by the system of the eye and the brain with a particular focus on trying to have a quantitative modeling of how information is passed from the retina to the visual cortex and on to higher centers for representation of objects. And as that information is passed from the retina to higher order regions of cortex, 
the information gets expectedly more and more complicated. And this is one of the examples of bottom-up processing within the central nervous system. I think kind of a launching point for the focus today in our show is kind of the distinction between bottom-up processing and top-down processing. And how does this begin to take place in the retina? And at what point do the two processes kind of converge? So well, let's start with this. There is a lot of visual information out there, which we might try and understand. The world is a very complicated place. From every point in the visual world arriving at the eyes, we have information about shape and size, and the, that chromatic or spectral color information that's coming from a place, and how bright it is, and its pattern, and its texture, and on and on and on. And that's an awful lot for the visual system to have to make sense of. And one strategy that uh, vision scientists have used to try and think about how the eye and the brain make sense of all this is to understand what kinds of representations can be built up just by taking the information as it arrives raw into the retina and what kind of information is imposed top down perhaps by our expectations of the structure and organization of the world. We have certain beliefs about how tables are flat and apples are round and when we look out in the world we impose some of those beliefs upon our perceptual input to try and help us make sense of all of this information that we're getting. This would be the top-down processing model. And bottom-up being trying to extract even elementary things from our visual input, such as edges and colors and contours. Like seeing little golden-colored edges come together to form hexagons, and those hexagons arranging in a three-dimensional space to form an even larger shape, and eventually recognizing that shape as the honeycomb of a beehive. And my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that at the very basic level, at the level of the retina, that's where you start to perform this bottom-up processing where dots become kind of lines. And, and Yeah, so I think if we want to take a super simple view of how the eye takes in information and gets it back to the brain, we have to start with the photoreceptors, which are the rods and cones. And it's not too bad to think of them as the pixels on a sensor of a camera chip that you might have like in your phone when you take a picture. And those sensors are sensitive to different kinds of wavelengths of light. So more red stuff or green stuff or blue stuff, for example, in the case of the cones, or more sensitive to dim or bright light. And that's the most basic information as it first arrives in the retina. And that's the last point in the eye and the visual system for which anything is simple. After that, it gets really complicated really fast because information from these different cells are now combined and contrasted to start to look for differences between these sensors. And in fact, to a first approximation, what our visual system really cares about is differences, edges where one spot is brighter than the surround around it, things which are gradients or changing, stationary, constant things are boring. The visual system looks for differences and that processing starts all the way back in the retina. As you know, these photoreceptors, the rods and cones, they receive light information and then signal to other retinal cells, and from those cells to retinal ganglion cells, which ultimately send this information back to the thalamus via the optic nerve. But those intermediate cells, the horizontal cells and bipolar cells, the ones between the photoreceptors and the retinal ganglion cells, they're already looking for differences. When they can't see a difference between adjacent areas, they send a weak signal. Meh, that looks just a little red. But when they do see a difference between adjacent areas, that part's red, but wait a second, that part's not red. Then that retinal ganglion cell is going to fire like crazy. That's the information that arrives at the lateral geniculate nucleus. And then the truth is we know a lot about how aspects of spatial vision are built up as you move to steps higher, but there's a lot we still don't know. So one thing we do know is that each of the little receptive fields, combinations of information from the sensors of the cones and the rods, those start to get organized into strips of receptive fields to start to represent lines and curves. And that's the representation that we start to have when we arrive in V1 and as you move up to higher levels. But then lots of other stuff we're still figuring out. So for example, exactly... And this is all part of the bottom-up processing model for sensory information encoding. But if you looked out upon the world and you saw only pixels or you only saw edges or shades of color, it would be an unbelievably limited experience. 
and the process of recognition or the identification of a common object under differing circumstances at an odd angle, in different sizes, or at varying distances from your retina. This would be an impossible feat. As I'm thinking about it, it kind of blows my mind that we're able to process this information and really look for subtle differences and the, the visual system processes these subtle differences so extraordinarily well. But at the same time, if I were to look at a black and white photo of my mother, I would still recognize my mother as in this black and white photograph. It wouldn't just be that this is a different face and different setting. It's, a, you know, it's the same face. It's just under different circumstances. That's a great example. And in particular, it's a great example because so you know a lot about what your mom looks like because you've seen her over many years in lots of different lighting conditions and wearing different stuff and in the sunshine and in the rain and indoors and outdoors. And you've built up a very generalized representation of what your mom looks like. And a reasonable question or a question that vision scientists would love to know is, okay, where is that happening? Where do we have a representation of what Jim's mom looks like in a generalized way, not in just a one particular picture? And we do have some information about where in the brain that kind of processing localizes to. And we've, there have been a couple of, a number of different studies uh, observationally and also, you know, in primates and in humans looking at specific types of neurons. And then at that point, I get really confused as far as which neurons are responsible for which function, because I think of the brain as a more distributed processing network. But still, if we lose one neuron that's responsible for a particular person's face, it seems that we lose the ability to process that face. So let's dig into those details a little bit because it's really a, it's a fascinating story. So, okay, you've got these really elementary representations happening in the retina. By the time you get to the first visual area, V1, now you're thinking about lines and edges being extracted. We still have a long way to go from a line and an edge to a generalized representation of what somebody looks like, a familiar face. So where does all that happen? Well, the first thing is there's a lot of visual areas that extend on beyond V1. And in fact, what we do know from very early work uh, that was done in recordings made from uh, monkey visual areas is that if you march your electrode far enough anteriorly, you get down into the temporal lobe and you move far enough forward, you'll start to find neurons that respond to surprisingly isolated classes of things. So this is work that a guy named uh, Charlie Gross did years ago in Princeton while Hubel and Wiesel were focused on their Nobel Prize winning work, of figuring out lines and edges in V1, Charlie Gross very bravely just started looking more anteriorly. And in the macaque the monkey ventral cortex, he found that there are these neurons that respond to incredibly complex things. So the faces of other monkeys and shapes and uh, landscapes and all sorts of things. And these cells were very regular in this behavior. So he was able to find neurons that would respond to a particular shape. And if he came back several days later and recorded from that neuron again, yep, that neuron still liked that shape. And this was the first hint that these elementary representations eventually would build up to something more complex. Something complex, like a very specific human's face. We're talking about. So, okay, let's get concrete. So uh, you leave V1 got area v2 v3 v4 and then you start getting into additional visual areas ventrally called lo and vo and then you find these regions which now have very categorical type representations for example the so-called fusiform face area which is located in the fusiform gyrus in the ventral occipital or inferior temporal area and this region has neurons that respond avidly to faces and they respond to other things but boy do these neurons like to respond to faces and a lot of work has gone into trying to understand exactly what those neurons are coding for. And here's one thing they're not coding for. It's not the case that there's one neuron at this location for what your brother Tim looks like and another neuron at a different location for what Stephanie looks like and on and on and on. So it's not the case that there's one neuron per face per person. But instead, it looks like the set of neurons within this fusiform gyrus area have a more complex relationship to representing how faces vary with respect to one another. Again, highlighting how much the central nervous system really looks for differences. So these neurons code how faces look in an abstract face space. What do you mean by face space? Okay, so let's imagine you take photos of a thousand people. And then you take those photos and you put them in a computer 
and you do an analysis to look at how those pictures vary from one another. Every face looks a little bit different, but you can describe that variation between faces with a few key dimensions. Some faces are more round than other faces, and some faces have a darker complexion than other faces, eyes that are farther apart than other faces. And so you could make sort of a list of these dimensions and then characterize any one face as how much of any of these properties that it has. So you could think of a face as being a thin face with high eyebrows and small eyes and a pale complexion, and that would then start to describe one individual in terms of these properties on a dimension. So this seems to be the coding scheme for how this part of the brain is representing faces. And in effect, what this face area is storing is the position on the perceptual sliders that define how a face looks within a perceptual space. Clinically, this comes up when you have a patient with face blindness or prosopagnosia from a stroke of the inferior temporal lobe or herpes encephalitis or degenerative conditions like the semantic variant of FTD or Alzheimer's disease. With any of these conditions, you could lose this holistic interpretation of a face, but you'd be able to retain a lot of your other more basic kind of bottom-up visual processing abilities. Of how all those lines and curves and parts create a face. A face with a wider chin or a smaller nose or thicker eyebrows. That's all preserved. How it compares to other faces is what's lost. So, we have this face fusiform gyrus. And you already knew that area was responsible for recognizing faces on the basis of more than just the sum of its parts. A patient with prosopagnosia would completely lack this skill. They describe it as a strange unfamiliarity. These patients see a face. They know it's a face. They can often tell the gender of the person that they're looking at. They know if the person is old or young. But they just can't quite create this integrated representation of who it is. Because a face is more than just the color of a person's eyes the positioning of their teeth, or the arrangement of the hair on their head. Now let's say that I have prosopagnosia, and I'm with my brother Alex. He's a young, well-built, ex-marine kind of guy, with a giddy smile. His face is more than just the blue-green eyes, the cropped but curly hair, and a strong jawline. There are minuscule, ineffable subtleties of his face that my brain can decipher without even my own awareness of them. And then my brain fuses these features into the singular concept of, this is Alex's face. Only now, because I have prosopagnosia, my brain can't do this. I can't recognize him. That's got to be so frustrating for him. It may even piss him off. What do you mean you don't know who I am? He might ask. And although I can't tell by his facial features who this guy is, I can still tell that, this is a face that's angry with me. Yeah, so it's actually amazing the number of things that prosopagnosic people, despite being completely unable to recognize a particular person, they can still tell if that person is angry or happy or sad because representation of the emotional content of a face has a different neural substrate. It seems the amygdala and the superior temporal sulcus are two spots that are quite important for that. Similarly, and this one I love, is that there is a dedicated neural system for knowing where somebody else's eyes are looking. And that is also located within a little bit more superiorly within the temporal lobe. So when you look at somebody else's face, you know immediately, are they looking at you or are they looking at the donut on the table? Maybe they're thinking about taking the donut. And this doesn't just apply to humans. Even dogs have this ability to see where you are directing your eyes. And this is part perhaps of the special bond that people have with dogs. Dogs who can also recognize human faces and identify their master over anyone else. But again, the region of the brain responsible for this type of higher level cortical processing is geographically unique from the area responsible for facial recognition. So again, just to reiterate the point here, if you injure a region like the face fusiform gyrus, you can lose the ability to recognize a person by their face but still retain the ability to interpret emotional expression, to determine eye movement and direction of gaze, and even to retain the ability to recognize a person by other means, such as the sound of their voice. Ultimately, 
The human brain, and the primate brain and the dog brain to some degree, all our brains have dedicated a considerable amount of real estate to facial recognition. Whether you believe this is because we see faces so often on a day-to-day -day basis, or if you believe that this facial processing is an integral component to social interaction. Here's Dr. Aguirre again. There are a number of interesting demonstrations of the oddness or specialness of our face perception. And most of these relate to the fact that we have this very integrated, holistic representation of faces and that we're really used to seeing faces in a certain configuration. So we have enormous lifetime worth of experience of seeing upright faces with a particular configuration of face parts. And when that configuration of face parts is rearranged, kind of like a Mr. Potato Head experiment, it really stands out. But a nose in place of an eye in place of an ear, yeah, you can tell that that's going to be weird. But there's something that's even more subtle than the rearrangement of the various face parts that will stand out to you in a person's face. And here's where we get the Thatcher illusion. The Thatcher illusion, named for Margaret Thatcher, the first face that was manipulated in such a way to demonstrate this effect, is a, a demonstration of the special integrated holistic nature of face perception. Here's how you can create this effect at home. You take a photo of somebody and you just use Photoshop to turn upside down the mouth and the eyes. So you keep the mouth in the right position on the face, but you turn the part upside down. Same thing with the eyes. You just snap a selection box in Photoshop around the eyes on a picture, and you rotate that 180 degrees so it's turned upside down. So if you look at that picture that results, it looks grotesque. So the face just looks totally uh, abnormal. The mouth is upside down. If you're not already doing this on your phone and you're not driving or anything, you should definitely Google the Thatcher illusion. You'll see what he means. But here's the odd thing. If you then take that whole picture, that whole face now, with its distorted and turned upside down mouth and eyes, and turn that whole thing upside down, you are now no longer able to detect easily that the face has been altered in any way. Now it's just an upside down face. So you can't tell that a face has had this really obvious change made to the, to the mouth and the eyes if the whole picture is turned upside down. We're just not good at interpreting faces that are upside down because we have a holistic integrated representation of upright faces. But not just faces. Some of us have unintentionally developed a holistic understanding of other objects. Grandmasters in chess, they've spent years looking at chess boards, and they are able to integrate and obtain a holistic representation of the appearance of a chess board in much the same way that we have a holistic, effortless impression of a face. If you lay out a chess board and place one of the pieces at a location where it could not have arrived there by a legal set of moves. The chess grandmaster will instantly recognize that there's something wrong with the chessboard. And it's not a matter of checking each piece and considering how it got there. It's just it looks wrong. The visual impression is wrong. Grandmasters at chess will develop this kind of a face-like recognition ability for non-face stuff. And they do this effortlessly, just like we do when we're recognizing faces. And many of these same sort of phenomena that have been demonstrated with faces, like the Thatcher illusion, you can demonstrate with other sorts of stimuli too in people who are expert recognizers. In addition to facial recognition, there are other neurologic skills which we as humans have developed using this top-down method of information processing, one of which I'm sure you've heard about. <laughs> but this one simple clip with one word has divided the country. I want everybody to listen to it now at home. If you have The Laurel-Yanni debate. Laurel. In case you missed all the social media hype about it last May, some people hear the name Laurel. Laurel. And for others, Yanni. Laurel. It all comes down to how each of us processes raw information regarding frequency or the pitch of sound differently. So if I were to artificially adjust these features, you may start to hear the other name. Let's see what happens. Laurel. Yay. 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 Now I'll swing the pitch up. Laurel. 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 There are other examples of this in recent pop culture, like the dress. 
Just type in, quote, the dress into your Wikipedia toolbar and you'll find it. But perhaps more clinically relevant is one of the examples that Dr. Aguirre provided. The distinction between whole word processing versus phonemic processing of written language. So there are neurologic conditions like uh, semantic dementia in frontotemporal disease, where people lose the ability to read whole words at once, and now they have to read words letter by letter and sort of sound them out and construct the word. And so there it's also the case that for reading, we have a holistic word reading mechanism where we recognize whole words immediately and just read it as one unit, and then a part letter by letter word reading mechanism. And those can be separately damaged in neurologic conditions. Just like the way that facial recognition can, again, be damaged by a posterior cerebral artery stroke, but the ability to identify face parts and facial expressions remains fully intact. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground so far, and we're almost there. But I promised you grandmother neurons. All right, what's a grandmother neuron? So grandmother neurons as an idea, began almost as a criticism and a joke in vision and cognitive neuroscience. The argument was made that if visual recognition is increasingly complex, if there's an area of the brain that responds to lines and curves, then an area that seems to like color a little bit more, and then a more advanced area that responds to shapes, and then, oh no, here's an area that seems to like faces. Could there actually be an area that responds to a very specific face? Where does it end? Could there be an area that responds to your grandmother's face? A grandmother neuron? We can't become so specialized that each and every neuron is dedicated to one individual thing, right? One neuron that represents what your toast looks like in the morning, and one neuron that represents, you know, which fork in your knife and fork drawer looks like, and one neuron that represents just singly what your grandmother looks like. That seems like no good way to build a brain. And that's how it started out, as just a criticism. It was then with some surprise that neuroscientists started to find some neurons that seemed grandmother neuron-like because it was something that shouldn't be happening. So one thing to know is that the fusiform gyrus, this area that we've been talking about, that when you damage, you get prosopagnosia, nothing in there looks like like a grandmother neuron. You find neurons that, again, are responding to oh, the general shape and tone and texture properties of faces, not one neuron per face. But a neuroscientist named Itzhak Fried, working with patients who were undergoing epilepsy monitoring for pre-surgical planning, he started to do a thing that this neuroscientist, Charlie Gross, had done decades ago with macaques. And that was he just started showing pictures. He had these patients, he had electrodes, in this case, all the way anteriorly within the hippocampus. And Itzhak Fried started showing these patients pictures. And one thing he noticed, quite to his surprise, was that when he showed pictures of Jennifer Aniston, which was just one of the the celebrities in the pile of photos that he had of different pictures that he was showing, he could find neurons that seemed to respond to pictures of Jennifer Aniston. And he'd find other pictures of Jennifer Aniston and he'd show those and the neuron would fire to that. And then he'd go find a picture of Julia Roberts and hold that up. And nope, the neuron was not interested. It only liked pictures of Jennifer Aniston. And we interpret that information as there's just one neuron that may respond to Jennifer Aniston in everybody or in somebody, or it's just that there may be a neuron out there that responds to faces that are very close to Jennifer Aniston, or maybe it's just more of a distributed network. And maybe there are other neurons at play that we haven't found yet. It's a controversy and a really interesting one. So this whole idea that there could be a Jennifer Aniston neuron, just like there could be a grandmother neuron, a neuron that represents just what your grandmother looks like, well, it runs up against these philosophical limits that why would you build a system like that? It's very inflexible. If that one neuron died, would you forget what your grandmother looked like? And it also seems that you'd run out of neurons. There's a lot of things in the world to represent, and it would be hard to have enough neurons to represent all that stuff. It does sound impossible, right? One neuron for Aunt Casey, one for Cousin Laura, one for your high school boyfriend. Where does it end? Do you get a neuron for each person you've seen at any point in your life? And honestly, how improbable was it that these scientists, when they found the Jennifer Aniston neuron, that they just so happened to be recording from that unique nerve cell, and they just so happened to present the subject with a photo of that unique person? I mean, 
There are thousands of famous actors and actresses from the past 20 years, and 100 billion neurons in the entire human brain. The odds are astronomical. Dr. Aguirre again. These neurons that seem to respond to Jennifer Aniston were found in the hippocampus. And the thing we know about the hippocampus, of course, is that it's spending all day, every day, trying to link together things that you see and experience and smell and hear into memories. That's what it's for. It's the memory building unit. It's trying to associate stuff, sensory experience, emotion, everything else into networks of associations to form memories. And that's where these Jennifer Aniston neurons were found. So it's interesting. One might ask, well, maybe the reason there were Jennifer Aniston neurons that were being found was because these were patients who were sitting in a room being shown pictures of Jennifer Aniston. Right. So maybe they weren't triggered by the concept of Jennifer Aniston at all. Maybe they started firing because they were encoding or retrieving memories of being shown a picture of Jennifer Aniston. And so they start to build a little Jennifer Aniston memory association network. A little gathering of neurons who were firing only because they were just firing. A fire together, wire together kind of thing. And again, there's nothing in this area of vision neuroscience which is not hotly debated and viciously battled over in academic conferences. But I think the evidence is pretty good that if you are sufficiently familiar with any narrow area of a visual category, you will develop representations that have every property that we associate with the specialness of face representations. So we considered the example before of chess players who are so familiar with chess boards that they develop holistic integrated representations of chess boards. But you can find this for lots of different categories of things. And in fact, this is something that you can see clinically. So people who have right-sided ventral occipital lesions can get deficits for perception beyond faces extending to other categories of objects. So you might not be able to recognize your dog anymore after you've had a prosopagnosic type lesion. Or my car, or, you know, some other... Or your car, or in people, for example, who are really experienced bird watchers. There are examples of patients who have had uh, lesions which cause prosopagnosia, and they lose their ability to tell the difference between different birds that had once been very familiar. So whether it's bird watching or chess competitions, or you're just a kindergarten teacher, top-down processing of sensory information is a critical component to the way that we interact with the world. Without it, it would be like looking at the world almost as if it were rendered in pointillism. Everything no more than a bunch of dots. No connections or boundaries, edges or shapes. But because of the way that the brain can impose its own expectations on a visual scene or on a sound, we can recognize the face of a friend through a fog, or isolate and attend to a single person's speech amid a background of loud conversation. And we have this amazing neural machinery that can recognize facial features and emotions and other complex visual data that would be practically impossible to do without it. That wraps it up for the program this week. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. If you like the show, we could really use your support by rating the program on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. The Brainwaves podcast is produced out of Studio 3 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Our show this week was produced by myself, Jim Siegler, and Jeff Aguirre. Music for the program was courtesy of Cola, John Watts, Lovira, Loyalty Freak Music, and Scott Holmes. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeon. For more fascinating factoids and the latest in clinical neurology, check us out on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio or Facebook at Facebook.com slash Brainwaves Audio. From Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I'm Jim Siegler. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.